with that, I will hand things over to Milt Geiger, who is the Extension Energy Extension Coordinator at the University of Wyoming. Oh, hang on, Milt, I might have muted you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Are they seeing my screen yet, Tori? Yep, I am seeing your screen. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us for the inaugural Second Tuesday Technical Shorts series for the E3A curriculum, the Exploring Energy Efficiency and Alternatives. And now I have to get the jokes out of the way with Technical Shorts. It was difficult to come up with a good name for this series, so when you hear Technical Shorts, you might think of nerdy athletic wear, perhaps some shorts with a calculator built in. But these are designed to be webinars on a very specific focused topic that you can take and immediately integrate into the materials that you're teaching. And we recognize that some are going to be relevant to you and some are not, and we'll talk about the series as it's uh, moving forward in the future. But today, we'll address a topic that is uh, actually quite exciting, particularly to myself, and it's the federal changes in the federal small hydropower regulations. And once again, this is a uh, joint effort Montana State University, University of Wyoming Extension, and it was funded, or it is funded, through a Western SARE Sustainable Agriculture Research and Extension Grant. Okay, why does this matter? Why do changes in federal hydropower regulations, particularly for small hydropower, have an impact on your clients, your constituents, those you work with in, uh, in your role with Extension or other natural resource <coughs> education efforts? Well, primarily, the changes in regulations almost serve as an incentive. They are lowering the cost of hydropower feasibility examinations and construction. And what this is doing is it actually increases the competitiveness of small hydropower projects moving forward. And I have to bring this pun in as well. And the idea with these small hydropower projects that are under these new federal regulations is they're already working waters. And we'll talk about what I mean by working waters here in a moment. But the idea that this adds another revenue stream, I even put it in quotations for you pun lovers out there, for the water users, where they're already using the water for something. Hopefully it's economically productive and profitable. Well, here maybe small hydropower can fit into this to increase the revenue that is extracted out of the same amount of water. Okay, the key players. Uh, always hard to know what type of background folks have with hydropower regulation. So I'll talk about the two entities that are most involved in the regulation of hydropower in the U.S. The first is the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And here we're going to focus on a couple key terms, and it's qualifying conduit facilities and also exemptions for small projects. Now FERC also grants licenses for large projects, uh, think of projects in the Pacific Northwest, uh, perhaps projects on the Ohio or Mississippi where you can have a very large project that requires a license. I'm going to sort of ignore that for this presentation and focus more on the efforts for small projects. The other one is Bureau of Reclamation, which many of you know is part of the Department of Interior, and I'll refer to it as Reclamation. And they provide an option for developing small hydropower on their facilities called a lease of power privilege. And once again, this is for reclamation projects only. And I'll sort of break down where things are ap applicable and where they're relevant. Okay, what is small? Now, when we talk about small hydropower, it actually includes a great range. But based on the recent legislation, which I'll talk about in a moment, we're going to call small hydropower less than 5 megawatts. And that's for both FERC and reclamation. If you've opened up your E3A curriculum or have seen it elsewhere, they often discuss about hydropower in the context of micro hydropower and small hydropower. And I'm sort of using the term small interchangeably today. But just for clarification, micro hydropower we often consider at 100 kilowatts or less. And many times we focus on even smaller systems than that. A uh, system that would be behind the meter, in essence, applying electricity to offset the consumption at home, farm, or business. And the other scale is a small hydro facility, which is 100 kilowatts to 5 megawatts, once again. And there you're really focused on selling electricity into the retail market, where you're looking at hydropower to create a new source of revenue for your operation. Now, by the way, how much energy is produced by these? Because these are rated capacities. If I were just to take a typical, we'll pick one right at the middle or right at the edge of uh, micro and small hydropower, say a 100 kilowatt system, 
And if that's a relatively high capacity system, perhaps it's at a dam or something like that, where you have 85% capacity factor, which certainly isn't unheard of in hydropower, you're going to provide enough electricity for 75 typical Wyoming or Montana homes. So when we say small or micro, 75 homes providing all the electricity for them seems pretty significant to some folks. So if you take that out further, you know, if you have a 5 megawatt facility, uh, you know, you're providing a significant amount of energy. There is an asterisk next to that 5 megawatts. Uh, despite the fact that these regulations are simplifying things, there's always a little bit of confusion. And with FERC, they've actually classified small as other things under 10 megawatts in certain circumstances, or all the way up to 40 megawatts in other circumstances. And it depends upon the project structure. But I'll sort of break that down. But the sweet spot that we're talking about today is really less than 5 megawatts. And once again, a 5 megawatt facility uh, it can be on the order of a oh, 15, 20 million dollar investment. So you know, this small is, is large by many people's standards. Okay, now where is a viable site? Where do these regulations really apply, particularly in the context of the work that many of us in extension do? The, the new regulations apply primarily on existing conduit and infrastructure. And what is conduit? It's a way uh, to convey water, and, uh, such as dams, canals, pipelines, even center pivots, wastewater treatment plants. There's more options. But these new regulations apply only to water that's being used for some other purpose. So it's already in a canal to go someplace to irrigate crops. It's already in a pipeline to be distributed to a municipal water supply system. It's already coming out of a wastewater treatment discharge plant and flowing down a cascade into a waterway. Those are all things that are considered a viable site for these new regulations. Now with that, of course, the other key characteristics come into play. You actually have to have a viable, financially viable site and technically feasible site to develop hydropower. We won't talk about that too much, but things like head flow, seasonality, which gets to a lot of projects in irrigation, your competitive electricity prices, your distance to transmission load, all those things come into play. But the entities that we are thinking about most directly here are things like irrigation districts, ditch companies, and municipal water systems. So here's the key legislation. Got to give you, a, these are actually hot links, by the way, when we post the presentation, you'll be able to go ahead and click on these and you can review the legislation, which is impressively short. Neither of them are over four pages. But the Bureau of Reclamation Small Conduit Hydropower Development and Rural Jobs Act of 2013, and you can see the language that the Colorado Small Hydropower Association put out describing it here, that it expedites small hydropower development at existing Bureau of Reclamation-owned canals, pipelines, aqueducts, and other man-made waterways. And then the other aspect is the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act. And this one deals primarily with FERC. And it, once again, focuses on those same type of conduits, and it wants to shorten the regulatory time frames of those low-impact hydropower projects. And now here's the amazing thing. Although this is a webinar, I expect to hear shock and awe emanating from across the West here. Both these laws passed the Senate unanimously and had very strong bipartisan support in the House of Representatives. Now, how is this possible? Small hydropower resonates with many different groups. Certainly clean renewable energy folks like it because of those, uh, uh, the attributes of renewable energy, you know, limiting greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, other things. Other folks like it because it does create jobs primarily in rural areas where we value the, these type of capital investments and the additional revenue stream that it can provide particularly to ag producers. And the other aspect of it is, hey, this is working water and particularly in the West, we like working water, we like to see it in a form where it's providing a benefit to communities and this is just another opportunity for that water to provide a benefit to the folks in that area. So with that, it gets a broad range of support, and lo and behold, it passes unanimously. With that being said, it did take about three years uh, for it to pass, although they knew everybody was going to agree to it. So don't give uh, Congress too much credit there. Okay, let's talk about the different aspects. So reclamation lots, lease of power privilege. What is it? So since reclamation are federally controlled uh, water, uh, water distribution projects, a lease of power privilege is actually a contractual right given to a non-federal entity to develop hydropower on that project. 
Now, a couple key components of it that I've listed out here, and once again, I apologize that these are sort of wordy slides, but I, I recognize that anytime you're talking about regulation, we need to get into the meat of it, and it's also nice to have a summary on hand after. But the other aspects of it is that the hydropower project cannot interfere with the primary reclamation project purpose. For instance, if it's an irrigation project, well, guess what? It still has to be primarily for irrigation. It can't become a hydropower project. And a lease of power privileges can only be granted at facilities that are authorized for federal hydropower project developments. And what this means is when the Bureau of Reclamation built many of their projects across the West, the feds had the opportunity to develop hydropower, and they did so at many sites. We're very familiar with federal dams and the low-cost electricity that they provide. These other sites that are particularly identified for small hydro development, the feds could develop there, they just haven't. And there's many reasons. It can be a lack of access to capital, management administration. So really what they're trying to do is bring private capital into these places where the federal government has yet to develop hydropower where it could still be viable. I will say, and I could actually bold it, underline it, put exclamation points by it, there is a strong, strong preference for the existing water users. Matter of fact, in the new legislation with the lease of power privilege, the existing water users, users such as an irrigation district, get the first right of refusal on the lease of power privilege. So they're trying to empower those users that are already in partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation. So that's a reclamation lease of power privilege in a nutshell there. So let's go for some more acronyms here. And now we're with FERC, and this is called a Qualifying Conduit Facility. And this is one of the most exciting parts of these new legislation. And yes, I said exciting on federal regulations. And what a Qualifying Conduit Facility is, there are certain criteria that I've spelled out here. And you'll see some of them are familiar. I've already described them. It's an existing conduit that's not primarily for the generation of electricity. <clears throat> it's non-federally owned. Otherwise, it'd be a lease of power privilege. The facility has installed capacity that does not exceed 5 megawatts, and also wasn't going through some of the FERC process prior to when this legislation was passed in August 2013. And here's the big part. You do not need a FERC exemption or license. It means that after you go through this process, FERC washes its hands of it and says, hey, we know it's low impact just by the nature of the project. We know it's relatively small. You're not putting in a new Hoover Dam here, and we want to make this as simple as possible. So after you go through this process, you're done with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. That's very exciting because prior to this, the way the Federal Hydropower Act was written, you could be installing a 100 watt, an itty bitty tiny hydropower generator on perhaps a canal fall where you just wanted to feed a little electricity back into the grid because it was a novelty to you. Theoretically, that system needed a FERC exemption or license. And going through that process, which was designed for much bigger, bigger projects, could be entirely cost prohibitive. So now with passing this legislation, if you meet certain criteria and go through a process, and we'll talk about the time frame here in a moment, you no longer are under the jurisdiction of FERC. Briefly on what a FERC exemption is, and this is where you sort of have that sliding scale for what is small hydropower. This is for a 10 megawatt or less facility. Remember 10 megawatt, 30 40, 50 million dollar facility perhaps. <clears throat> an exemption is actually an exemption from licensing. Licensing is sort of the next step up with FERC. And this is what you hear about relicensing dams in the Pacific Northwest where they have to do every 30, 40, 50 years. And licensing is certainly more costly, compl complicated, and it requires a renewal. So FERC has come up with a streamlined process saying that if you meet certain guidelines, already an existing conduit, low impact, so on and so forth, then you're still under FERC jurisdiction, but the process is much, much simpler and potentially much less expensive and cumbersome, thus allowing these smaller projects to be developed. So that's an exemption. So remember to compare it back and forth, qualifying conduit facility and an exemption. The one other aspect of FERC that was impacted by this legislation was a preliminary permit process. And what a preliminary permit is, you file this with FERC, and it provides an exclusive 36-month right to develop a hydroelectric project. Now, you file these permits only if you think that there might be another claim, if you will, on this hydropower facility where someone else sees the potential here on a non-federally owned dam, and it may not even actually be the owners of that dam, but they want to get something developed. And this preliminary permit was designed to provide some certainty for the developer that if they invest time in the planning, the feasibility examination, that they'll actually be able to recognize their uh, return on their investment and somebody else just won't come in and 
do it instead of them. Well, the 36-month process, unfortunately, many projects could not get developed in that time frame. It took longer than three years. So the new legislation says that if you meet certain criteria, you can actually extend this for another 24 months. Oftentimes, a preliminary permit is not necessary, especially for smaller projects, but it is certainly an option that people need to be aware of, and the new legislation makes it, once again, a, a more effective tool for these more complex small hydropower projects. Okay, FERC first reclamation. A key aspect here, if you only remember a few take-home points, you only need one. You only need that qualifying conduit. You only need to be deemed a qualifying conduit or get an exemption or a lease of power privilege. You don't need both. And I'm a little bit facetious down there. Actually, FERC and reclamation have come up with very durable, long-lasting memorandums of understanding that help determine who has jurisdiction over the project. Is it on a federal facility? Is it someplace where the federal government had the right to develop hydropower? And the nice thing about it is you apply to one, they'll check with the other to make sure that it's in the proper jurisdiction so you don't go along two parallel redundant tracks. That, once again, makes it much simpler to go through this process. All right, where to start? We want to take this to action. Now, the first thing before we get into the regulatory hurdles is that pre-feasibility. We won't even call it a full feasibility examination. But you might see flowing water out there in an irrigation district and boy, be like, well, I've been staring at that for 30 years. Does it make sense to develop this? Well, there are some tools out there to help you determine if that is a viable small hydropower project. You know, on the, on the basic level, more or less, should you invest more time in exploring it? You can, of course, contact Extension for Assistance, the Bureau of Reclamation, some of the national labs, particularly the Idaho uh, National Energy Lab and others, have put out excellent online tools to help you go through this process. In addition, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation has actually gone through and assessed many of their canals and conduits to see if there are places where viable projects could be developed. And I just pulled the numbers for Wyoming and Montana, although they do it across the West, actually across the entire country where they have projects. They identified 121 conduits in Wyoming that they thought had a positive cost-benefit analysis, and there are 32 in Montana, and there's also some prominent on-power dams in both states where they thought that there was a positive benefit-cost ratio. And they have both those reports to summarize it, but also some tools for you to help analyze your own project. And then you step back and say, all right, is it a federally supported controlled water project? People are going to know this, those that are using the water. Then we contact Reclamation, and we'll show you their website in a moment. If the non-federal project, private ditch company, uh, a private dam, other things, uh, a municipal project perhaps, then you contact the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. That's really how you start down this divergent process. But once again, remember, if you contact the wrong entity, you might waste a little time, but they'll sort you and get you steered in the right direction. Oops, and uh, the agencies are making the process approachable. So the lease of power privilege, is, by the way, the hot link takes you to their lease of power privilege website. Remember, right of first refusal to existing water users. So you can't just be driving by an irrigation district, not be part of that district, think, boy, I want to put a hydropower facility there. The irrigation district would get the first right to develop that. If they don't do it, then they'll bring in other components. On the Reclamation's website, there are numerous templates, guides, flowcharts, et cetera. They're really tasked with developing these projects where they're viable. So they're trying to make it as easy as possible. So they do have <clears throat> documents there to help you guide through this because they also recognize that in many cases, you know, this small hydropower development will be done by people who don't have experience in hydropower development. They may bring in outside expertise, but for instance, an irrigation district, they know water well, but they might not know energy markets well. So they're trying to make that easier, and once again, you can also get to those recent assessments that show the potential in the West. For the qualifying facility guidance, once again, that's a sweet spot where we're under five megawatts and have those exemptions, or excuse me, not even exemption, I can't use that word there, where you are no longer under the jurisdiction of FERC if you meet these certain criteria. Well, they also have plans and templates for this notice of intent to, see, to seek this designation as a qualifying uh, conduit facility. And then uh, as of January, they reported a 63-day decision time. They're actually tasked with providing a 60-day decision time as part of the legislation where you have 15 days 
for them to respond to your notice of intent. They take some public comment for 45 days and then they make their decision. So once again, they don't want these to be hung up for six months, eight months, ten months, even in many cases it was a couple of years. Now if you have a small hydropower project, you can't just risk capital and invest time in something that's going to take that long to just get the regulatory approval. So right now, averaging that 63 day decision time. And with that, I'm getting about to the end. I'm trying to make this a technical short. So I want to thank you for attending this E3A technical shorts. I will tell you that there's more webinars upcoming. We have more technical shorts, and it'll be the second Tuesday of every month. For instance, next uh, month we'll talk about USDA incentives for energy efficiency and renewable energy. We also have the broader program resource sharing webinars, uh, which are the fourth Friday of every month. And there's one at the end of March here, and it'll feature different state energy extension programs, sort of give you an idea of what other folks are doing. So we have the 35,000 foot view, and then, should we say, the more detailed examination here. So with that, there's my contact information, the website. Happy to steer you in any uh, you know, direction related to small hydro. Actually, Wyoming is, and Montana are working on a new small hydropower development guide. And there are other development guides across the West that can help you also navigate some of the state aspects of hydropower development and really just take you through the process. So with that, Tori, what have we got for uh, questions there? Sort of a whirlwind tour of federal small hydropower regulation. Sure. Uh, I see a couple people uh, joined in after I kind of gave the spiel about asking questions. If you'd like to ask it yourself verbally, you can um, raise your hand. There's a little palm-shaped button you can push, and then I can unmute you, or you can type in the questions box, uh, which is also included in your dashboard. So we have a first question. What if a new diversion is constructed for a run-of-the-river facility? Does FERC have jurisdiction there? Ah, uh, good question. So uh, run-of-the-river would mean that you're uh, taking water out of a, uh, uh, a stream or another natural waterway. Specifically for hydro development, you do it without a dam, so it's also considered generally to be low impact. But because you're doing, you're, you're creating a facility that's specifically for generating electricity, you still would be under the jurisdiction of FERC, uh, but it would most likely qualify for an exemption. So you wouldn't get that qualifying conduit facility designation where you're removed from the jurisdiction of FERC, but you probably could uh, go through that exemption process. So a little bit uh, more cumbersome, but once again, they've tried to make that process a little bit more approachable too. Other questions? Um, you mentioned that the streamlined regulations acted as an incentive, and they're wondering if there are any other incentives. Okay, and that is one thing we'll address at uh, the webinar next month. Small hydropower sort of gets a bad rap in the renewable energy world, although it's slowly been improving. When we talk about other sources of renewable energy, wind, solar, uh, there's a federal tax credit that goes with it, 30% tax credit. They get to take accelerated depreciation. When those laws were drafted, people were thinking about hydropower as an anadromous fish blocking uh, scourge of the environment and did not include uh, small hydropower, even low impact hydro, in those incentive structures. So you don't get to take those uh, juicy federal tax credits and other incentives. Uh, the principal one that comes into play is a USDA incentive. And in a rural area with the right ownership structure, there could be a 25% grant or some guaranteed loan from USDA up to, uh, I believe, a half million dollars. So a $2 million project could get a half million dollar grant theoretically. But otherwise, the incentives for at least the federal incentives for small hydropower are, are pretty limited. Uh, at a state-by-state -state level, there are specific incentives, but they're generally a little bit smaller. Uh, some small uh, hydropower projects can be funded under at uh, reduced loan rates from Water Development Commission and other things in many Western states. Okay, uh, here's a question. Are there in-stream or river turbines that you know of in the West that are under 5 megawatts? In-stream, so that would be something where you just drop into it. There certainly are. Uh, that's been something in the low impact, the small hydro world that people have been exploring. And there's lots of different designs out there. Unfortunately, there isn't one that I can say is really commercially accepted right now. They're trying a lot of uh, new designs. Some go in municipal uh, pipelines where they reduce a pressure-reducing valve. 
but there are some uh, resources out there. Actually, the Bureau of Reclamation put together a study. It was done in 2012, I believe, which examined all the emerging technologies in <clears throat> low head is what they're calling it because it's in stream and you're dealing with you know particularly flow but not a whole lot of head uh, low head hydro development and you can actually access those from the Bureau of Reclamation website and um, in the future here we'll try and get them posted up on E3A for you but there are some uh, oh Natal systems out there is probably the most uh, prominent but there isn't a place where you can go see a lot of these in the in the West in, in a canal or an existing structure or an existing stream but that is certainly something that's receiving increased attention. I'd be happy to address that more if uh, somebody wants to clarify what they're looking for there. Okay, and uh, what happens if an irrigation district doesn't want the reclamation lot? Okay, so the lot being the lease of power privilege and <clears throat> they once again have the first right of refusal. So if it, they think it makes sense for them and they want to develop it, they're the ones who get to do it. If they decide they don't want to do it and there's a time frame set out by the Bureau of Reclamation where uh, folks get to decide that, uh, Reclamation is still tasked with developing these because of the, once again, the clean energy development, the rural jobs, and, what, and just using working waters as effectively as possible. So if an irrigation district doesn't want to do it, then a, a third party can come in and do it and actually the Bureau of Reclamation will then take applications to say okay we're looking for other qualified developers here and in many cases they, they would still have to work with the irrigation district for easements access but uh, a lot of it would fall under the same uh, regulations that, Bureau, that deal with Bureau of Reclamation access to these facilities. So their end goal is to get them developed. They would rather work with their existing water partners. They have, in many cases, a 100-year relationship with these irrigation districts, so they prefer to do that. But if uh, an irrigation district, for some reason, does not want to, and it still is a viable project that other entities wish to develop, the Bureau of Reclamation could certainly move around them to develop a project. Okay, any other questions? Oh, here's like one. About on time here for eight. Okay, we short. we do have one more. What was the first short? What was the oh, first short? Oh wait, hang on. I'm trying to make sense of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was the first short? Oh, I think was it also recorded? And if we missed the sh session, where would we be able to listen to it? Uh, Art, this is actually the first one. So. Um, I think we will be making them available on the E3A website from here on out, which yes, is listed the E3A on... website's actually going through a uh, a refurbishment, so all these will go up in the uh, we'll list them on the uh, the uh, web page home, but also under topic. So this one will also be uh, inserted into the small hydro, the micro hydro discussion. But yes, this is the first one. But there are more to follow. Eleven more are promised. And by the way, folks attending, it all isn't just going to be me, fortunate for everybody who's listening. If there's a topic that you would like to address, uh, certainly contact me and we can get you set up. And you're welcome to provide uh, an overview on a topic that is uh, near and dear and exciting to you as well. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Oh, wait, one more. All right. Great to know this is the first one. Sorry to cobble out the question prior to such poor grammar as I was trying to beat the end. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you, Art. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's attention, and uh, hopefully it was a useful, brief introduction to this. And there are certainly more resources out there if you really want to get into this subject matter, and I'm happy to continue this conversation with any of you. Okay. Thanks, Mel. All right. Thank you, Tori.